My name is Pastor John, and as always, it's an honor to be with you, and we are continuing to move forward in our series that we are calling A Movement Begins. And really what we have been doing over the last couple weeks is we are exploring and unpacking the first few chapters of the New Testament book of Acts. And what we're looking at is that we know the story of Jesus, or we read the teachings of Jesus and can be inspired on those in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but we're recognizing that Acts is also a continuation of the story of Jesus, that even though Jesus parts in physical form very early in the book of Acts, Acts tells the story of how the Holy Spirit, of how God and how Jesus is continuing to equip and empower the church back then, but also the church today, to do the kingdom work that he has planned for us all. So a couple weeks ago, we started with, excuse me, in Acts chapter 1, and we saw how Jesus told the disciples to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit, which would give them power, which would equip them to be witnesses for his kingdom and for his gospel message. And last week, Pastor Vicki talked to us about what happened when the Holy Spirit did come when the presence of God showed up and rested upon the followers of Jesus. And if you go back and read in Acts 2, there's a lot that happens on that day of Pentecost. We know that they started speaking in so many different languages, and even though they weren't speaking in the languages that were their native tongue, they were able to understand and and interpret and hear everything that was being said and the praise that was there. And Peter, inspired by that Holy Spirit, gets up and preaches what would have been probably a, a very epic sermon as he laid out how Jesus had fulfilled all of the Old Testament prophecy for the Messiah and that he's pointing that Jesus is indeed the resurrected King and the Lord over our lives and as a result of everything that took place on that day of Pentecost and the sermon that Peter is giving, the scripture tells us that 3,000 people believed and chose to follow Jesus that day. So as we talk about a movement beginning. It's really that day where the Spirit fell upon them to equip, to empower, and to embolden these these early disciples. And it seemed like maybe it started with a very small gathering of people, a very small group of people. But all of a sudden now, it's gaining traction very quickly. It's moving at a rapid, rapid pace, and the Holy Spirit is empowering them to be messengers of Jesus. And what we see now in the rest of Acts 2 is that a new community is starting to form. A new community is starting to take shape. And what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look a little bit about what that community looked like, how we can make our community resemble the things that the Spirit were doing in the early days of Acts here. And we're also going to hear from Chris Santer in just a little bit. I've invited him to share a little bit about an opportunity that God's placed on his heart for all of us to engage in community and in fellowship together over the coming months. But let's go ahead and dive into our scripture for today. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2, beginning at the 42nd verse. You can turn there in your Bibles or you can follow along on the screen with me. But there we read this. It says, All of the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. You know, as I spent some time in this text and was kind of picturing what this early community looked like and the early uh, uh, things that they were dedicated to, there's a phrase that popped in my head. It's a phrase I'm sure you've heard. We use it kind of all over in our culture, but I think it gets used a lot in church in terms of talking about the community that, that we desire to have or that we feel we should be aspiring to. And that phrase is, do life together. You ever heard anybody say that? I want to do life together. It kind of just means that, that we are, are, are being vulnerable, transparent, open. We want to be there through the ups and the downs of what's going on in our lives. We want to do, experience, and go through, navigate this life together. And that phrase is kind of contagious. People say it a lot. It seems to resonate with us. And I think it resonates because there's something inside of us. No matter how introverted some of us say we are, there is absolutely something inside of every one of us that is wired 
or even created for relationships. We know that we are built for community. And it should really come as no surprise that right now in our day and age, we live in one of the greatest ages of connectivity that the world has ever known, right? With the advancements of technology and and the internet and social media, it's made it possible for us to connect in ways we never could have uh, even just a handful of years ago. We can connect with anyone and everyone wherever they are and wherever we are, and really we can do this with very little effort on our part. But what's fascinating to me with all these tools and resources that can equip us to be connected, there's a lot of studies out there that show from a sociological perspective that even though we might be more connected to one another than we've ever been throughout the course of history, we are also showing high numbers in loneliness. The loneliness numbers are almost off the charts and people are feeling more unknown even though they're connected in the world around them. So somewhere along the way, the connection, the connectivity, the tools and resources to remain connected isn't simply enough. Somewhere along the way, we need a community that fully clicks, that thrives, that's meeting those needs. And we have so much commonality amongst us, and we need to share our experiences to fill this void together. So the question that raises in my mind is why is there so much loneliness, or why do we feel like something's missing even with this ability to be connected? What are we missing here? And again, I think the scripture we read from Acts points to some of those answers for us and can hold some of those answers. And honestly, I don't think the phrase do life together really does justice to what we see happening in the scripture that we just read. I think what we read is so much deeper than just doing life together. This early community, this growing community of believers and acts, it formed after the ascension of Jesus and the arrival of the Spirit at Pentecost, and they found themselves living and embracing an extraordinary new way of life that was impactful that was life-giving and pointed and inspired more and more people to Jesus, and that's what we see in there. But before we dive into this a little bit, I want to start by just looking at the first four words that we read, because I think it sets it up for us with some pretty important things to note. The first four words that we read was that all the believers, and here's the key word this morning, devoted themselves. Okay, that word devotion there. You know, you can look at any translation that you can go to your favorite one and you'll see that this word is the same in each. This word in Greek here for devoted, it means something very intentional. And I love the fact that if you think of what the devotion or what it means to be devoted, you can go to the dictionary and it will say something about like a per, uh, persistence or you're adhering to something or you're being intensely engaged in a, a, an individual or in a, a hobby or in a circumstance or it's being attended to constantly. It's not something that you're going to let go of very easily, right? It's not something that you're going to waver or be wishy-washy, I can't say that word apparently, with. But anyways, to be devoted is there. So what's happening in here in the scripture is it's describing that these apostles were devoted. And I think that word is important for not only its meaning, but it tells us that whatever is going to follow, whatever Luke is going to list here in this, this devoted community, is going to be of importance. So this is what we're seeing here. What they were doing is they were devoting themselves with persistence, with intentionality and consistency. And the question is, what did they devote themselves to? What were they being so devoted for? And I want to do this, is I want to read the passage one more time, and I want you to just hear it fresh and hear it with this idea of devotion and what it might look like to be devoted in these different ways. So again, it said all of the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. 
You know, right out of the gate at the very beginning, we see a pretty strong list of what these disciples were devoted to. We see that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to the word of God, to what Jesus had inspired and demonstrated and taught them to pay attention to. They were devoted to fellowship, right? It's kind of a churchy word, but they were devoted to sharing their lives together, to being in each other's company there, to being with other believers. They were devoted to the breaking of bread and to praying together as well, but as you keep reading and you see that it wasn't just these things you might come to church to do, activities that they were devoted to, they were also devoted to one another as individuals, not just to rituals, but they were devoted to each other. We see that they were providing for those who were in need, right? They were attending the temple, they were going to praise God, to worship together, together. They were doing this in unison with each other, and what was the result of all this devotion? What was the result of all their intentionality and their persistence to do these things? Well, it says at the last side, 47 there, that the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, this isn't a sermon on church growth or how we can get more people in these pews and all this and that, but we see that when this community was devoted to these things, devoted to the teachings of God, devoted to the needs of one another, devoted to being in fellowship and praising God together, it says that there was a sense of awe over them. There was something almost contagious, something curious about this devotion, and more and more people wanted to be a part of it to know and discover who this Jesus was as Lord of their life as well. So this text really describes for us what a lot of people have called like the five main purposes of the church or the five main functions of the church. Maybe you've seen this list before. Those five things are discipleship, fellowship, ministry, worship, evangelism. I mean, these are words that we hear about, you know, to be balanced in our faith journey and our faith life and our community life together. These are things, though, that we don't just put on a screen or write a book about or list them for no reason. They're things that the earliest followers of Jesus, many of whom know him personally, devoted themselves to at the beginning of the movement. In other words, dedication and devotion to these areas in their lives are what really fueled the movement. It's what created the momentum, the curiosity, the equipping, the emboldening, the empowering of the Spirit for others to come and be a part of this as well. And remember, as we look through the book of Acts here, this is not just a history book, right? Acts is still being written to this very day. It continues in the way God's kingdom is moving through each and every one of us as we are still his hands and his feet in spreading his good news of his gospel and the kingdom around us. So what I want us to do for just a minute is just to very, very, very quickly take a look at these five areas and do a little assessment in our own lives. Okay, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or share anything, but I do want to ask you to be vulnerable before the Lord, to be transparent, and to just listen to what God and what the Holy Spirit is saying to us about these different areas of our own lives to see how our devotion is or maybe even the opportunities that are there for greater devotion in some of these areas of our lives. And the first one is discipleship, right? We see that right away where they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, they learned from those who knew Jesus, right? That's discipleship. We learn from others who walk with Jesus. We learn from God's word what it is that he aspires for our character, for our lives, for our faith, for our trust, for our hope. And the question is, why is that so important? Well, I know that for me, each and every day that we have, like, influences that are out there every day. I mean, would you agree with that? Whether it's a billboard that's on there, a commercial, there's ads and everything, there's information, there's conversations, there's things that happen, and all these things coming at us are not necessarily bad, I'm not trying to say that, but they can definitely impact and influence us in how we think, how we act, how we respond in certain situations. It can be a good influence, it can be a negative influence, we understand that. But I love what one author says, this is N.T. Wright, he said it this way, he says, when no attention is given to teaching and constant lifelong Christian learning, people quickly revert to the worldview or mindset of the surrounding culture and end up with their minds shaped by whichever social pressures are most persuasive, with Jesus somewhere around as a pale influence or memory. You know, he's reminding us that we don't want to get lazy about our time in God's Word. 
right? We don't want to get lazy about the importance of finding God's word, whether it be through time in the Bible or learning from one another and talking and sharing about how God is growing and deepening our faith. Because if we do, we're going to find intentionally or unintentionally that the influence is going to be coming from elsewhere instead. And all of a sudden, it's something other than the word of God that might be inspiring our actions, our character, our movements, everything there. So we know that discipleship is important. So again, for you, what does it look like for you to be devoted to discipleship? Is that an area of, of growth or opportunity? Have you found some, some ways that that's worked for you? Share that with one another. But devotion to discipleship is important. But the next one is, is fellowship, okay? Fellowship. We see it in the scripture as well. It tells us that they were together. You see that language in there. They were together a lot. They had things in common. They went to the temple together. They broke bread in each other's homes. Now, I know for some of us that might sound a little intense. You might can look around at the, uh, your pew mates right now and say, you know, I love you and everything, but I don't want you in my house every day, right? You know, we understand that. And it's, for some of us kind of in today's Western world or our individualistic society, you know, we're not always as quick to share as we might think we are, right? We kind of hold things close to the chest sometimes. We're a little more private and reserved there. We, you know, we don't necessarily want to overcommit ourselves as well. We definitely don't want other people involved in our business. You know, Scandinavian stoic culture here, right? We got to uh, weather this on our own. We don't necessarily want to share what's going on all the time. But we notice, though, when we do that, we miss the opportunity to be together and the importance of oftentimes when we're going through something or experiencing a, a hardship or a struggle in our life, if we remain isolated, we start to believe that we're alone, right? That no one else can understand the struggle, that no one else can relate to this, and it's really in the community that we are stronger. And I'm sure we can all think of times or seasons in our lives where the shoulders of another brother or sister in Christ to lean on have been an absolute pillar of strength as they help and continue to point us to Jesus in our season of need and vice versa. But fellowship is really just even what's happening here in the foyer. Fellowship is being together. Being devoted to fellowship is remembering to come to church on Sunday. It's coming to that barbecue. It's attending that event, if nothing else, just to be in each other's company, right? Just to have those conversations and support and encourage and share, or to use the phrase, to do life together. So what is God saying to you about your devotion to the Christian community? What is he saying to you about your devotion to fellowship? Let's move on to ministry, though. So we have discipleship, we have fellowship, ministry. They were absolutely devoted to ministry. And where I think we see it most is in verse 45 when it says that they were selling their possessions and they were selling their belongings and they were taking the gains or the money that they got from that and they gave it out to anyone that was in need. They met all of their needs together. And really, if you think about it, discipleship is kind of how we grow deep with the Lord, right? Our time in God's word, our time learning from others and, and learning about Jesus, that's how we grow deep in our faith and deep in our trust. But ministry now is how we grow wide and how we grow more broad in here. And as this movement was going, again, if there was a need amongst these early believers, you can bet that they took care of it. And what I love is it says in the text that it was all of them that were doing this, right? It wasn't just the apostles. It wasn't just those who knew or walked or journeyed with Jesus physically. It was all of them. And that translates to all of us as well, too. Ministry is not just the work of the pastors. The ministry that we do here at Discover Church is not just the work of myself or Pastor Vicki, and we're glad that it's not because we would be limited, right? Ministry is, is all of us. Ministry is the, the saints, the believers that come together that devote themselves to recognizing the needs of the community, recognizing the needs of our loved ones, of our brothers and sisters in our neighborhoods, wherever we are, and asking for God to open our eyes and to help us meet those needs in the way that he has equipped us or blessed us by praying for an individual, by helping financially, if that's what it is, by, by helping them with the yard work, etc. I don't even want to make a list because it could go on and on and on, but it's the devotion to that. It's not pretending I didn't see it or I don't really want to check in. I don't really have time for that today, but rather, no, I want to be here as a minister equipped by the Holy Spirit to minister to people around me. So what does that devotion look like for you as you try to see and be involved in the needs and the opportunities that God has around us? And then obviously, you can't have discipleship and fellowship and ministry without worship, right? 
And absolutely were they devoted to worship. These verses, they, they, they kind of describe these practices of them having communion together, of praying together, of praising together. But I think it's so important for us to just remember sometimes that worship, you know, it's not just when we come in here on Sunday mornings and sing songs together or, or hear God's word. Worship can and really should be a way of life. Worship is an intentional way of life where every single thing that we do actually is an act of worship. I, I, I like to think of it this way, is that our lives, our entire lives are a song of praise to Jesus, right? Our entire lives is an ongoing song with additional verses and choruses and bridges of praise to Jesus for all that he has done and all that he's continuing to do in our lives. In fact, another author, A.W. Tozer, if you're familiar with him, he put it this way, and I, I have loved this, this sentence for a long time. He says this, we are called, we are called to an everlasting preoccupation with God. Okay? Each and every one of us is called to be preoccupied with God. That doesn't mean distracted, right? That means that we are just focused in all things, in everything, that God is present, that God has blessed us, that God has a spirit that is leading and equipping us. We are preoccupied with God, with whatever our actions or our days have. And that right there is worship. That is giving God the glory and the honor and staying rooted in him and looking to him in all things. And we know that we need that devotion, right? We know that we need to be devoted to worship because something amazing happens when we pause and give God the glory. Something amazing happens when we can slow down and worship God in our day to day. And what that thing is, is it starts to, it rejuvenates our spirits, right? It strengthens us. We know our days can be long. We know our circumstances can be heavy. There can be seasons that are just downright difficult. But we see, we see that in worship, God strengthens us. And that's good news because we need that. And even as he's equipping and challenging and calling us to do his kingdom work, guess what? We're not going to do it by our own strength, are we? We need God to strengthen us. And the way we do that is through worship. He strengthens our lives by focusing everything back to the one true source of life in our life. So what does that look like for you? What does it look like to be devoted to worship? And then the last one, the last one is evangelism. Now, I want to be clear, if you look at the text, you might be able to come up to me and say, you know, it doesn't really say anything about evangelism in that text. And that's, that's true. It doesn't say it in those exact terms. But we do know that, obviously, evangelism, which, let's take away the big word, it really means just telling people the good news of Jesus, right? Whether that's through your words, whether that's through your actions, we're telling people the good news, the gospel of Jesus. It was absolutely an essential part of what the early church was doing because they wanted to tell us the Lord was adding to their numbers to those who were being saved. There were clearly conversations taking place. There were clearly questions being asked and people answering them by sharing the good news of Jesus. But again, I don't want us to get hung up on the numerical growth part of that. That's wonderful. That's awesome. That's the movement. And we pray that for the world in general. But what I want us to see is that I think this growth, this momentum, the contagious nature of the community was because of their devotion, right? It wasn't because of a, a, a sermon that Peter gave that was just amazing. It wasn't because of, of the music or, or, or anything else that the early church had. It wasn't because the meal was the best food that they've ever eaten. It was because of their devotion to discipleship because of their devotion to fellowship and being together, because of their devotion to ministry and meeting the needs of others, and their devotion to giving God the glory and the honor in all that we do. And I think that that's a reminder and an invitation for us as well to be devoted to these things in our own lives and to be devoted to these things together because we can pull up far too many studies that show us that this momentum seems to be waning a little bit, right? At least in some parts of the world. And that's our part of the world. There are so many churches and all the major Christian denominations are not reporting huge growth numbers. In fact, most are in decline right now. And I don't say that with hopelessness, but I say that to get our attention, to remind ourselves that devotion to these things is at the very beginning of the church. And I believe that we are called to do just as those early apostles did to be devoted to these things together. And again, this today is an opportunity for us to examine our own devotion and to ask 
ask God to lead us into greater and deeper aspects of our lives. And here's what I want to say. All those things, those five things, again, the discipleship, the fellowship, the ministry, the worship, evangelism, it's not just about one or the other for us. It's really about balance, right? We need all of those things. We might be more equipped or more in tune in some of these other areas, but for all of us, we want to find a balance of these things in our lives. In other words, if we are digging deep into discipleship and studying the Word of God, but we can't stand being around other people and we avoid fellowship around every corner, well, we're going to have a void again in our life, right? Right? We're going to have something missing from what God desires and intends for us. If we love to worship God in every way that we can, but we'd rather not get our hands dirty by, by ministering to the needs of others, well, again, we're, we're, we're missing something. Right? There's a void there. It's about balance. Being devoted in our lives is, is, is drawing people to Jesus, right? And that's what it's about. So we want this balance, this persistence, this intentionality, this consistency to live the life that God is calling us into. And here's what I want to say. The good news about that, even if you feel like, wow, man, I, gotta, I could work on this a little bit, or I think God's been kind of tugging on my heart a while to be a little more engaged in some of the things here around church or whatever it is in any of those areas— I want you to do what the kids did a little bit ago. Look around. Look around at each other. This is not, a, <laughs> Fred waves, I love it. <laughs> this is not a journey that we are doing alone. Our Christian faith, our journey with the Lord is not on an island by ourselves. We do this together. We are devoted to these things together. We are not alone. This is all of our story as God is continuing to write the book of Acts through each and every one of our lives. And I want to just kind of end this sermon time here. And I want to invite Chris Santer to come on up. And he's going to share a little bit of a couple things. He's had an opportunity to do some mission work in the Philippines where, trust me, they have, uh, he's experienced this kind of community in some really cool ways. And he doesn't have enough time today to talk about everything, so you'll have to catch him after. But he's also going to be sharing with us about an opportunity that God's placed on his heart for us to start gathering on a regular basis as a community of believers to have some fellowship, have some worship together. And I'm going to get out of the way because he's far more passionate than, you know, than I could ever be. And I appreciate that about you, Chris. So come on up here. It's coming. It's coming. There we go. I want to say Mabuhai Discover Church. That is welcome in Tagalog, which is Filipino. And you learn that on Filipino airlines as soon as you walk on. They're like, Mabuhai. And then you understand what that means. So um, yeah, my name's Chris Santer, and I'm sure many of you have seen me here before at Discover Church. And, um, you know, I'm excited as Discover Church is going through a transition period right now that what I have done in the past, I have been with a large international ministry, and I was in charge of leading prayer ministry. I was also in charge of the fellowship night that we had. And I want to talk to you about that real quick because the fellowship night it started because of Discover Church. It started on a Christmas Eve here at Discover Church where I was feeling led because this prayer ministry, we took prayer requests from all over the world that came in into this ministry, and we prayed upon every one of them. No blanket prayers, and we would sit on Zoom, I'm not even kidding you, for five to six hours, lifting up every single individual name on 20-plus pages of prayer requests that came in. And so what I started to see in our own team members, they were hurting. There was hurt in their lives. So if we're not mentally well, if we're not physically well, if we're not spiritually well, how can we be able to help others? So I was here at Discover Church Christmas Eve, and uh, I just felt the Spirit leading me, go home and open your Zoom link because there are people at home on Christmas Eve that are lonely and they are by themselves. So I went home, posted on Facebook, hey, I'm gonna open up the Zoom link, hoping to get one person. Christmas Eve, I got 10 people from around this country and around the world. And it became the most blessed night of people just sharing what God's doing in their lives. You could see the loneliness in their lives was being taken away. I got to learn things about these people. I never knew what the Lord was doing in their lives. It was so incredible. It was so amazing. And so I started to see hurt in our own group, in our own family. 
And so that fellowship night ended up to be for us was every Friday night. We had that. And when people came, it grew and grew and grew because they felt the love of the Holy Spirit. Because these fellowship meetings that I'm going to be starting here, we are led by the Holy Spirit. There is no agenda. You come with what you want to talk about. You want to bring scripture? You bring scripture. You want to sing a song? Let's sing a song. You want to share your story? Let's share your story. If you love to bake and you want to try something out on us, bring it on in because I'm sure we're going to eat it. Let's break bread together. Let's fellowship together. Let's pray for one another. If you have a prayer you want to share, we're going to pray. If you have an unspoken prayer, we're going to pray for that because God already knows that. And I am excited about this, but I just wanted to give you a little background on myself. I know we're cramming a lot in today. But a background on myself is many, many years ago, I was blown up in an explosion in the oil fields in North Dakota. I should be dead. I suffered shrapnel throughout my body. I was burned all over. You won't tell by looking at me now. And you won't know this by talking to me, but I have a traumatic brain injury. I struggle to process, to gather information, to remember. It's like having the first stages of Alzheimer's for me. I've worked very hard because of God and what he's done. It's not a self-pity story. It's what God was molding me to do in my life because he took me a non-believer. I didn't grow up with God in my life. I didn't grow up in church. I was a Thomas. I was somebody that needed everything to be proven to me in order to believe. And God lit me up like Saul on the road to Damascus. But I'm not going to share the rest of my story. There's a lot to it. But if you want to come to fellowship night, let's talk about these things. And I want to hear your stories as well. So I did have one foot in the grave. And as I said, all is possible through God because he is working in each and every one of us, even when we don't know it, because he is the good shepherd. And he is the voice that we need to hear and we need him to lead us. So today, brothers and sisters, I stand before you first and foremost as a servant of God, most important. I am also a licensed minister now. I have studied at Liberty University through the biblical studies program there. And I always tell people this. I can study and education is great. But if we don't have the Holy Spirit working with us, if we don't come before the Lord in prayer and ask him to lead us, we have nothing. I have nothing without him. I'm nothing without him. I also served as a lead teacher for Eagle Brook Church and Kids Ministry for many years. And as Pastor John said, I'm very blessed to be able to be partnered with ministries and churches in the Philippines where they've asked me to pastor churches. And someday, God is leading me to open my own church there and work with my ministry partners there eventually. So, brothers and sisters, we've heard the word together. Together. We've heard that word and we're going to hear it a little bit more. And I'm going to go through some scripture today. It's not going to be on the board. We're going to go old school, just like the original church where maybe they held a scroll up and said, hey, check this out, right? Not on the board, on a scroll. But again, we have no agenda. And I'll just give you guys an example real quick. We come in with no agenda, but if somebody's got an idea during fellowship night, bring the idea up. We had ideas come in that said, hey, Chris, and one of our next meetings, can we pray for the salvation of our family members? And I'm like, absolutely. So we compiled a list of unsaved family members, and we sat there and listed every one of them. We lifted them up to the Lord. And I just want to look at Acts 20, verse 28. It says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made. And this is it. God, the word you can be very powerful. You. Oh, whoa. But when God says you, we listen. And in this he says, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Now this is geared towards leadership, but just not towards Pastor Vicki or Pastor John or our council. We're all leaders. If a new believer comes into this church, guess what? If they latch on to you, you're leading. You're leading that person. Romans 12, verse 5 tells us, So we, through many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. 
We, the church, are to live again together under the command and the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the important one, everybody. This is one that touches my heart because we're seeing this, because technology is amazing, right? But it's also dangerous. During COVID, what happened? We couldn't meet together. What does the enemy want? He doesn't want us to meet together. He hates that. But we need to come together and crush the head of the serpent as Jesus did. What happened after COVID was people didn't come back. The internet made it too easy to stay away. We're happy that people come, hear the word of God, but fellowship and community is here. And Hebrews 10.25 tells us, not neglecting to meet together as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you, again, you see the day drawing near. In this verse, God is telling us not to neglect our Christian fellowship. We are missing out on encouraging one another when we do especially the new believers coming into church, we need to latch on to them because the world it wants to pull them away. Satan wants to pull them away. We would be missing out on motivating one another and coming together to help fellow brothers and sisters in need. When we come together in fellowship and prayer, first of all, we're glorifying God. It's not about us. It's about him, right? When we come together in fellowship and prayer, we are strengthening each other. We are refreshing our faith, and we are learning from one another. When I went to Israel with some of you, it was the most amazing time of learning from one another. So we will grow together in knowledge of God's word, together like-minded, one accord with each other, in unity to glorify our Lord. So as the day is drawing near of Christ's return, the spiritual battles, who feels them? The spiritual battles are going to continue to grow. But coming together again in fellowship and prayer, we will help each other endure through the battles of this world. It's a very special love, brothers and sisters, when we come together in fellowship and share with one another. And we talked about the Philippines, and I wanted to share, Jessica's got some pictures for us of what it looks like in the Philippines, brothers and sisters. Check this out. This is Lamb of God Alliance Church in the Philippines, where I'll teach. And you can see the banana leaves. Those are actually banana leaves. And this is after church. This is what we do after church, every single service. They come together and fellowship and eat and we have one other picture here, and that's Pastor June with the, the bald head there. And yes, no chopsticks allowed. Eat with your hands. Dive in, everybody. You say chopsticks to them over there, they're like, no, what? Well, we just go at it. But look at the, spot, the smiles and the happiness and the love of their community. They come together in the Philippines about two to three times a week, prayer meetings, fellowship time, and services. And most of these people live with nothing. But what they have is the greatest gift of all. That's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they love him, and they love to serve him and celebrate him. And I wanted to share that with you guys, um, a little bit of what happens over there. It's a wonderful thing that they just glorify God with such thanksgiving and sharing meals together, breaking bread, as we talked about, breaking bread. And I just want to leave you with a little bit, a couple of, of verses here. Ephesians 4.16 says, From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Jesus made the church so that we can all grow and mature in our faith again together. And when we come together with Christ, we are united in love. When one of us is struggling, one of us is knocked down, one of us is lonely, it's the brothers and sisters here, God's family, God's church, that lifts that person up, that takes away that loneliness. We're here for one another. 
We all come from different backgrounds. We all have different interests and gifts that God has given us. So it's important, brothers and sisters, that we come together through the spirit of truth, who is Christ Jesus. And we're here for each other to comfort one another, to live and to grow and to share our gifts with each other. So please join me for a wonderful night of fellowship and prayer. Let's come together as a family, united by the one who was our cornerstone, Jesus Christ. And out there in the foyer, you'll see a little red box on the counter. Next to that red box, I have some slips that say, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Fill one of those out and put it in a box. What day works best for you? Right now, we're looking at starting one day a month, but hope to grow to more days. And if other people want to lead and take on a day and you feel led by the Spirit, talk to me. Let me know. Let's let our time glorify God. And the last I want to leave you with, brothers and sisters, is Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. I'm sure many of you know it, but I love it. It says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God built on the foundation, and we talked about it, of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined, what? Together grows into a, temp a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. As they would say in the Philippines, salamat which means thank you, and if it's big thank you, bong salamat. <laughs> bong salamat, brother, love you. Thank, thank you, you brother, everybody. Thank you, thank you Chris. Oh, you can, you can take that, yeah, oh, you're good. Pass the baton. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So we'll hear more about the fellowship night coming up here. I just wanted you guys to hear a little bit of the passion that Chris has for that. And one of the things I love about this, too, is it's an opportunity. Uh, it's not from this time to this time. If you can make it for five minutes, you can make it for five minutes. If your schedule allows 20 minutes, great. If you have to be there 30 minutes late, no worries, Chris is there, and it'll just be a great time to be together. Let's have a word of prayer here as we look to God uh, to, to uh, examine our devotion and see how we can glorify him in all that we do. So Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we thank you today, Father. We thank you for the reminders from your word, and Lord, we thank you that uh, the way that you have designed it, it's really not that difficult, Lord. It's just for us to be together. It's for us to be united by your spirit. And Lord, we just ask today that, that you uh, help us to examine uh, our own lives, Lord, to look at what it looks like for us to be devoted to your word and to your teachings and to the community and being present with one another. One another, Lord, I pray, Father, that you uh, open our eyes each and every day, Lord, to see the, the opportunities for ministry, Lord. Help us to see the needs of others and, and Lord, equip us to meet those as you would have us, be that through, through a prayer or through our time, whatever it is, Lord, we just ask that you would uh, open our eyes to, to be your hands and your feet. And Lord, we ask that you continue to equip and embolden us by your spirit to give us wisdom and discernment, Lord, to follow you with all that we do, to let our lives be a continuous song of praise to all that you have done and are doing in our lives. And Lord, we thank you that, that you call us into your kingdom, Lord, that you make us to be be part of this movement. And Lord, as we do that, we thank you that, that you are present with us through your Holy Spirit, and we thank you that you've surrounded us with the brothers and sisters of Christ to, to journey with. So Lord, we seek to live out our faith, Lord. We seek to point others to you, so we ask that you strengthen, Lord, our bonds of unity, our bonds of love, and help us to be an encouragement to one another and to all we come in contact with as we point others to your cross and to your glory, and to your love for their lives. So we thank you, Jesus, and we pray all of this in your holy name. Amen.